Hello everyone, this is Miss Lindsay. Today we're going to talk about section 12.1 which deals with inverse relations and functions. Recall a relation is a set of ordered pairs and a function is a special relation in which each member of the domain is matched with exactly one member of the range. So let's first talk about the inverse of an ordered pair 1, 2. Well, let's take, the, take a look at the definition of an inverse in a relation. It is when the first and second coordinates of each ordered pair are switched. So I quickly graphed the ordered pair 1, 2. And if we notice, I'm going to draw on there the line y equals x. And we want to reflect that ordered pair 1, 2 over that line, which would give us the ordered pair 2, 1. That would be the inverse of the, func of the ordered pair 1, 2. So again, it reflects over the line y equals x. So in other words, we're going to switch our x and y values, which would give us the inverse of that ordered pair. So let's talk about how this would work in terms of equations. Okay, so if I actually was to graph any equation here, a function, or any equation, would we be able to find the inverse of it? Well, taking a look at our first example, we have f of x equals 2x plus 5. Now recall, f of x is also y. And we switched our x and y in our ordered pair 1 and 2 at the very beginning. So let's switch x and y in our equation. So we'd have x equals 2y plus 5. And then if we solve that equation for y, we will then get the inverse function, the quantity x minus 5 over 2. Okay, And we can use the notation f raised to the negative 1 of x. So that's the f inverse of x would equal the quantity x minus 5 over 2. So again, if we graph those, which we will do in our next example here, if we graph that original function and our inverse function, they should be reflections over y equals x. Taking a look at example b, f of x equals square root of 1 minus x. Again, let's switch our x and y. So x would equal the square root of 1 minus x, pardon me, 1 minus y. And we want to solve that for y. So we'd have x squared equals 1 minus y. Subtract over the 1 and then divide by a negative. So we get 1 minus x squared. Okay. Now what you will realize here is that all functions do have inverses, but the inverse might not necessarily be a function. Well, so let's go ahead and actually graph the inverse and the original function here. And let's take a look at these graphs. Okay. So you might want to pause, take a minute, get out your calculator, put in the original function, uh, square root of 1 minus x. And as you can see, I put that in our calculator as well as I put in for the second equation, y equals x. I have not actually graphed. You can see it's, it's um, not highlighted, y equals 3. So it's not going to graph that yet. If I just take a look at the square root of 1 minus x, it's your typical square root function that you would hopefully imagine. Um, it's basically part of a parabola. And then I have, it's supposed to be dotted, doesn't really look dotted right now. Um, but the red is our original function. The one that I'm going to leave in black, that is your y equals x. So if we want to reflect that, we should have something showing up in that fourth quadru quadrant. So let me go back and actually turn on our inverse function here. I do have that highlighted, so it'll show up bold. And from what we know about graphs, when we have y minus x squared, we would hopefully know that we're going to get a parabola that opens and down. But that's not actually the inverse. We have too much of the graph. We only would want that blue portion that's in that fourth quadrant. That would be the reflection of our original red f of x over that line y equals x. Well, why is this so? Well, we have to do something in terms of our domain. Let's take a look at our original function. If we are finding the domain of that function, we know with square roots, we would have to set that greater or equal to 0. 
We cannot take the square root of a negative number in the set of real numbers. So if we square both sides and we go ahead and solve for x, we would get x is less than or equal to 1. That would be our domain of that function. Well, let's now talk about the range of the original function. Now, the range, we might want to go back and take a look at our graph here. We're talking about the red function, the original function. As you can see, our x values, even if we look at our table, you'll see that our x values all the way on this left-hand column, it's at 1 and everything below. You can start seeing errors there when you have x is 2, x is 3. We'll take a look at that one value, x is 1. You can see y starts at 0 and starts to get larger. So our domain would be y is greater or equal to, I'm sorry, our range would be where y is greater or equal to 0. How does this relate to our inverse function? Now remember we switch our x and y's. So that means the range of the original function would be the domain of the inverse function. So we actually would need to restrict our domain to be x is greater or equal to 0. So when we go back and take a look at our graphs, if we restrict our domain to only the x values, that would only give us the blue portion of the graph. So our actual inverse of f would be 1 minus x squared, restricting our domain to x is greater or equal to 0. If a function passes the horizontal line test, then its inverse is a function and can be expressed in the form f of the inverse of f of x. Okay, so again, all functions have inverses, but the inverse is not necessarily a function. Let's take a look at our next example. Is 3x plus 4y equal to 10 symmetric to y equals x? Well, let's follow the same notion that we've been doing. If we switch x and y, would that be equivalent to the original equation. And in our case, it would not be equivalent to the original equation. Therefore, no, it is not symmetric with respect to y equals x. So if you interchange x and y, and the equation is equivalent to the original, then there is symmetry with, with respect to y equals x. And again, this comes off of what we did in chapter 9, where we were finding whether or not equations were symmetric with respect to the x-axis or the y-axis. Now we're doing it in terms of symmetry with respect to the line y equals x. Next example, here we have to recall composition of functions. We have our original function f of x equals 5x minus 3. We want to find f inverse of f of x. Well, first we actually need to plug in the 54.32 into our original function. So we have 5 times 54.32 minus 3. If we do that calculation, we will get that to be 268.6. Now we need to plug that into our inverse. Well, we need to actually figure out what that inverse is. So switch our x and y's of the original. I'm going to do this on this side here. So I'll have x equals 5y minus 3 and solve that for y. So the inverse of x would be x plus 3 all over 5. So let's plug in 268.6 into that function, the inverse function. function. So we have 268.6 plus 3 over 5. And if you solve that, Notice that you get 54.32. You actually end up with the original number that we started with. Is that always going to work? Well, take a look at B. I want you to pause the recording, figure out the answer to B, and see what you get for your answer. Pause the recording now. So when you come back, hopefully everyone got the answer of 87.65. Even though we reverse the order of the composition, you should still come back with the original number. Why is this? Well, we have a rule here. When we have 
f of the f inverse of a equals a and the reverse f inverse of f of x for all a in the domain of f this will always work you will always end up with the original number here and again this goes back to what we just discussed with our graph in talking about the domain and range the domain of the original function will be the range of the inverse the range of the original function will be the domain of the inverse function so again you're switching your x and y's Now let's take a look here at our last example. We want to find the composition of f of g and g of f. Let's start with the first one. So we'll have f of g of x will equal f of 3x plus 1. And we'll substitute 3x plus 1 into x in our function f. So we'll have 3. I'm sorry, I am doing the wrong one. We have f of g of x. Well, g of x is x minus 1 over 3. Now we'll substitute that quantity x minus 1 over 3 into our function f. So we'll have 3 times the quantity x minus 1 over 3 plus 1. Simplify, our 3's will cancel. x minus 1 plus 1, which will equal x. Let me switch colors and we'll do the reverse g of f of x. So f of x is 3x plus 1. We'll substitute 3x plus 1 into our function g. So we'll have 3x plus 1 minus 1 in the numerator all over 3, which simplifies to 3x over 3, which also is x. Interesting that both of those equaled x. What does this tell you about the function f and g? If you think that they are inverse functions of each other, it, they absolutely are. They are inverse functions. If f of g of x equals x and the reverse, g of f of x equals x, then the functions are inverses of each other. And this concludes section 12.1 notes.